Directors, Water for Food Global Conference. Uh, I really want to express my gratitude and thanks to the Doherty Water for Food Institute and, and to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for uh, making this venue available and, and facilitating <coughs> this activity this morning. My name is Andy Smith and I'll be moderating the session this morning titled Innovations in Irrigation Data Systems. And um, what we're going to do, the format will be, um, I will introduce each one of the speakers and they will give you a short presentation on their particular area of expertise and, and then they will take their seats and I would ask you to hold your questions until all the panelists have had a chance to make their presentation because basically as we close this out I think we've got a story to tell about what's happening in modern production agriculture. Um, of many of the things in my life, obviously I'm involved in the mechanized irrigation uh, business and uh, we've got some folks here that do telemetry, some engineering behind the scenes on the data, the various data systems that we work with, uh, arriving at conclusions on how we actually, how much to irrigate and when to irrigate, and then how you bring this into a part of a bigger comprehensive picture of, of integrated farm management. And we, we've got um, some real good expertise here, but basically each one of these folks has a very, uh, uh, I guess a very important role in what we do. Um, and primarily what we've tried to do, what we've attempted to do, is, is try to mitigate some of the issues that we have around the fact that we're, we're drowning in information but starving for knowledge. I don't know who said that, but um, it's very difficult for us to sort through all these sources of data that we have and arrive at actionable uh, recommendations. And additionally, um, we're also trying to tame a beast here. I think it was Dr. Stephen Covey that said, um, technology should be your servant and not your master. And in many cases, particularly with the latest, latest run-up that we had in, in agriculture, there was a lot of dollars in the system, a lot of folks made investments, and there was a lot of subsequent frustration with some of the systems that they invested in. It was hard for them to really see a return on the investment. And again, as my colleague Lee said yesterday, um, we're looking for things in industry that try to help make the farmer's cash register ring. Just to start with, I'll give you an example of what we're dealing with just in the irrigation data flow when we try to arrive at a recommendation, execute that recommendation with an irrigation system, and then give a work record back to a decision support system so we know uh, what we need to do as a follow-up, how we apply a trim tab after we've, made that, uh, after we've considered all the variables in the system. This is a slide from the Ag Gateway Group which is uh, a consortium of businesses that enable e-commerce in agriculture. And if you look, if you follow this, these lines get very difficult to follow. And I'll make this slide available to the attendees if possible. But it really diagrams all these various sources of information, how they move, where they move to, and who uses them. And it is a complex challenge. And if any one of these links in the chain breaks, breaks down, um, we have a failure and the system doesn't work and that causes that frustration. Whether it's a communication problem, whether it's a software compatibility problem, it, 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 it is a source of frustration for many farmers. So what our job has been done, has been an in industry, is to try to simplify those processes, make it easier for the farmer to execute. As far as uh, where do we fit in the overall equation? I know there are, there are themes related to the small holder, and I guess my, my appeal to you is to consider what we're doing in modern production agriculture and consider how it can be scaled back. What lessons can we learn, and then how can we apply some of those things to short circuit and perhaps um, create a situation where people can circumvent some of the, the failures that we may have encountered because we've tried and failed a lot of things, right? And so first up on our panel is Terry Schultz. Terry is the president of AgSense. It's from here on South Dakota, a uh, farm boy from way back. And uh, Terry has, has developed a, a system for connecting machines. And the first step in this process is getting the machines, the devices, the inputs all connected and getting that information moving in the first place. So Terry, if you would, please. <coughs> Well, thank you, Andy, for the uh, introduction, and uh, I'd like to thank all of you for taking the time out of your uh, day to uh, come to this session. 
Uh, I hope it's informative uh, for all of you. Um, in harnessing the data revolution, all the uh, participants up here are knee deep into this and no one single organization is gonna harness uh, the data revolution. So it's gonna take participation and partnerships from all of us. And some of those partnerships will be with our competitors. Uh, the space that we play in at AgSense, as Andy alluded to, is we remotely monitor and control a number of different applications and operations around a farm. So the first step on the journey to uh, uh, encompassing the data revolution is we have to gather data from somewhere in the field. And we have to be able to uh, connect and to uh, operate and control uh, machines and sensors around a farm. So with AgSense, uh, what we set out to do is, is con connect all the dots around the farm and our primary uh, focus in business is remote field management. And more specifically within remote field management, uh, we per the water technology piece is really what we're focused on. And another unique thing about AgSense is we are a brand agnostic company. So that means our focus is revolved around the idea of we're going to connect to a number of different brands of irrigation pivots or subsurface drip irrigation systems. It also uh, involves uh, interacting with a number of different soil moisture probes uh, from a capacitance probe to a watermark sensor to many different uh, brands of flow meters uh, from uh, manufacturers from around the globe, as well as capturing weather data from a number of different weather stations. What we do is we direct that to our cloud-based server, which is called Wagnet. So what happens is the grower goes to wagnet.net, which is just an acronym for wireless ag network. So each user has a, uh, it's a secure website, each user has its own uh, username and password where they can see all these multiple applications and operations around the farm. And from there, uh, Wagnet can handle the communication, two-way communication from the devices and sensors in the field, uh, back and forth, and through our API even uh, forward the information over to an agronomic uh, software provider. Now, I don't want to turn this into an AgSense advertisement, but really what I want to demonstrate is here's what's going on today out in the field and how it's moving around the globe into these different servers. Now, this is only one way of, uh, of handling the task. So on this slide that we show over here, uh, this is uh, on the user's Wagnet uh, page, what it shows, uh, we're able to group a number of different tasks around the farm and we're able to group them, uh, sort them, we can do a list view, a map view, um, a tree view, but what you'll see in group one is uh, on this demo page, there's a number of irrigation pivots, uh, they're doing different things, uh, it's near time information, uh, there's a grain bin, uh, for instance, uh, in group two, uh, I believe what we have is a weather station. We have a, a pump, a variable frequency drive pump. We have a flow meter. Uh, we have a soil moisture probe there. Uh, so a, a quick glance uh, with the, in regards to the soil moisture, they can tell if it's uh, too wet, too dry, or just right. So if the grower then wants to take a deeper dive into one of the operations uh, in their view, uh, for instance, if it's an irrigation pivot, and this particular irrigation pivot I pulled up last night is from a grower's uh, site down in Texas, they could take a deeper dive into uh, the unit. Uh, we can see from uh, this slide uh, the position of the pivot uh, by the blue circle in the graphic. We understand that the, it ha does have water, it does have pressure. Uh, we can tell that it's green on the outside, so it's moving. We understand the geospatial position of it. 
the pressure. Uh, we understand that the GPS on our device has a WAS signal. Uh, we understand that we have cell signal there, uh, which is that's the uh, way we're transporting the data and the health of the battery. Now, just to back up, one of the things that I did not mention in the beginning is we primarily uh, send our data and communicate uh, to our web server wagnet through the digital cellular technology. Uh, that works for us very well in most places around the world, but there are certainly other uh, communication methods that we'll get to uh, when we start talking about some of the considerations that need to take place. Now within this unit, we have a number of tabs where we can, uh, from the beginning, we can send a command to the irrigation pivot to start it. Um, we can stop it, we can change directions. Uh, we can set a uh, speed table for the grower so they can more accurately apply water in, at the angle it needs to and in the position in the field it needs to. Uh, we can set an end gun table. Uh, so there's a, a number of things we can do with this. We can chart graphically by a chart uh, the history and compare you know, the position to the pressure of the pivot. Uh, there's a number of uh, maintenance uh, things we can uh, derive from some of this information. Uh, we also have a place where with our field info tab, we can put the crop type, we can uh, take a dive into, okay, we have corn, it was plant date was on a certain date, it's an expected maturity date, the harvest date, and a number of crop observations that can be placed in this. Another nice thing that people are utilizing with some of this remote technology is uh, on our forms tab, we have a list of maintenance items that the grower or that stakeholder can check off so that they can have that at their fingertips uh, so they can keep the, the machine properly maintained and increase its efficiency. And there are a number of, there has been studies uh, just on proper maintenance. You can gain approximately a 6% increase in water efficiency just with maintaining the nozzle packages. From the unit view, and, and we move over into a report tab. And in the last 12 to 18 months, this has probably been the single biggest uh, uh, or popular feature that growers have been utilizing. And I see this as really being an exciting piece to what we do, because previously it was more about being able to remotely monitor control an irrigation pivot from your computer if you had internet access, or from your uh, droid device or an iOS device. But really what we're experiencing is we're experiencing a transformation in user behavior. Now those control features are almost, uh, people don't think about it because they've developed this trust and they're looking for the next big piece to this whole thing. And that really re happens in reports. So now what they're using uh, the technology to do is say, I really want to understand how much water I applied, when I applied it, where in the field. So that gives us a really nice graphical opportunity to understand what happened out in that field. And we can also take that opportunity to forward it to an agronomic partner via an API uh, to fuel what they're trying to do with their software. In this particular case here, I just uh, punched in, uh, I want to know what's going on from October 1st to October 20th, so we have a nice historical view with that. Very easy to operate. So where this is all headed in, in kind of the end result of gathering and capturing and, and uh, collecting all this data from soil moisture sensors and flow meters and, and uh, having this integration to the irrigation pivot or subsurface drip, or it could even be a solid set pump control for flood or a travel unit. But what it does is it more tightly connects the sensors to the machines. And what it does is these disparate sets of data converge. And when they converge, they tell a story. And that story, that data becomes information. So what we see here is a, an example of we take soil moisture data that we 
uh, collect from a soil moisture probe. Uh, and from an agronomic uh, partner, th these slide, th the pictures here were uh, provided by Crop Metrics. What they have done is they've took uh, an EC scan of the field, they, so they have the soil texture, they have the elevation uh, uh, fuel data piece to that. And when they throw their secret sauce along with us forwarding them the soil moisture and the as applied data from the irrigation pivot, they can come up with a prescription for that irrigation pivot and then they could forward that uh, back to the Wagnet cloud in which the user can make a decision of, yes, I want to uh, facilitate this prescription to the pivot or no, I do not. So it's really a collaboration between technology, uh, the trusted uh, uh, advisor and the grower. So this is uh, really becoming quite popular in production ag and uh, it shows the collaboration uh, that, that moves forward. The other piece to that is it simplifies the data. So when we can aggregate this data and move it around, it makes it simpler to use for uh, the grower and stakeholder and that will increase the utilization uh, of the technologies. So as we walk through this, we talk about uh, all the benefits uh, of remote technology within ir specifically irrigation. We see the benefits in increased efficiency. Uh, we have greater precision with the amount of water we apply, where we apply it, when we apply it. Uh, its simplification of the technology leads to greater utilization and acceptance among growers. The near real-time information uh, uh, leads us to, uh, there again, back to uh, greater efficiency and a better understanding of what's going on in the field quicker. Uh, the historical reports um, is, is truly a key piece into all this as we move forward uh, uh, through time. Uh, as I mentioned before, you have more efficient uh, use of water resources and a potential uh, for greater opportunity. So as we move through all this, I've kind of laid out, this is what AgSense does and how we do it. The one thing I did not uh, uh, speak to is, what are the considerations I need to take in, into account before I uh, jump into this with both feet? And as with all precision ag uh, uh, technologies, it is intensely local. And I can't, I just don't believe that can be overstated, that all precision ag and precision irrigation and precision technology is intensely local. So it's really critical that you have the local support, for instance, from an irrigation dealer or the trusted advisor who might be your agronomic consultant. It's kind of the three-legged stool that was uh, referred to yesterday. The other consideration that needs to be uh, taken into account on the front end is how are we gonna move all this data and how are we going to uh, you know, interface with these irrigation pivots and send control uh, commands to, uh, to the machine. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we use the digital cell network and that works for us very well in most cases uh, globally. However, there are places globally that there just is not cellular coverage. In those cases, the use of radio works very well. Some of it can be licensed, some of it can be unlicensed, but the net, of, you know, the net effect is you can still move the data and it needs to be considered. Another option is satellite. Our experience with satellite is, is it's a bit more expensive uh, than radio or, or cellular communications and it works well uh, for moving small bits of data. Uh, however, we, we've had some challenges of sending command uh, signals to machines uh, with the satellite. We have a hard time getting the same result uh, over and over, uh, more from a time and, and uh, spatial issue. And then the other technology that's been around for many, many years is just hardwiring into a telephone line. 
Okay, so they're, depending on the application and where you are in the world, that's really uh, comes into play on that. And most importantly, we've heard a lot of this discussed while we've been here, is where do I want my data stored? Okay, there's uh, pros and cons to each. Our application happens to be a cloud-based uh, application. Uh, there's some real benefits to that, uh, depending on how much you want to invest in uh, and maintaining an infrastructure and, and making sure things are backed up and you have connections to the internet and such. And the other is a private server based. And uh, as we you know, heard yesterday, uh, some of the considerations in a private server is, is kind of a trust issue and how, uh, how much control you want to have over your data. So just as, uh, to summarize, you know, what, uh, where I'm coming from is it, we're on kind of the hardware and the software and out in the field, we're kind of the physical layer. And uh, there's some exciting things taking place uh, in, in uh, precision irrigation today. And uh, I wanted to make sure that we touch on all the considerations that need to be uh, taking place in that. And with that, I'll turn it over to Andy. Thank you. Thanks, Terry. So the first challenge has been overcome, which is creating that connection to the field. And whether it's for command and control purposes or whether it's for data collection, uh, there are several options, as you can tell, and there's certainly some emerging options that um, need some consideration as well. The next challenge is, is to create this interoperability. And my friend Jim Krogmeyer from Purdue University has spent a long time sorting through reams of data because he's a farm boy. And he still is a farm boy and still farms a little bit in eastern Colorado and western Nebraska. And I'm going to ask Jim to come up and talk a little bit about his work at Purdue with the Open Ag Data Alliance and, and with creating these um, interoperability systems. Jim? Thank you, Andy. <clears throat> well, as, as Andy mentioned, I'm from Purdue University. I'm an electrical computer engineer. I work there with some ag and bioengineers, in particular uh, Professor Buckmaster, and a research engineer in my group named Aaron Alt, who's often the spokesperson for Open Ag Data Alliance, or OATA. And I'm pleased to be here to tell you about it. Let's see if I can get this to work. Whoop. Well, I would like to go back one, thanks. Um, I just, is to reiterate, my background is I, I'm a farmer's son and a landowner, kind of that happened by accident. Uh, I've invested here and there in it because my brothers were still there. Uh, we farm in Phillips County and Sedgwick County, Colorado, and uh, Chase and Perkins in Nebraska. Wheat irrigated in dryland corn and millet. The picture on the left is us cutting wheat, uh, I think, this, this year. Um, it's very dry there. I've always had the kind of feeling that I'm farming in, uh, on dune or in Tatooine. Uh, uh, and that's one of the things, when you do have a little bit of irrigation, a little bit of dryland, it's very interesting to compare the two. But my real job is an electrical and computer engineer, and I've, uh, in the last few years, been able to sort of turn the two loves together. I've been a signal processor and communication theorist, and I do a fair bit of embedded and cloud computing, and now I'm really looking more at these big data problems in ag and transportation. In the middle of that slide, you'll see uh, a little device there that we call ISOBLUE. This is really the thing that started our uh, connection to the Open Ag Data Alliance. It's an open source project based upon a Beagle Bone Black technology, and the entire purpose of it is really to forward CAN messages over Bluetooth to a smartphone and to the cloud. We've used this to create yield maps. We are currently working on interfacing soil moisture sensors to this. We have the capability now to include a very high precision and very low cost GPS. People have seen this and it's an open source project. If you go to that uh, web page, you'll find a link also to YouTube where one of my graduate students um, talks about data to the cloud in five minutes, sort of a, a high, high speed version of putting together one of those ISO blues. Um, we also do some work in, in uh, Open Ag uh, Toolkit, which is a bunch of apps really a suite of apps. The ones on the right there, elevations and watershed delineation, are two apps where we're working with smartphones essentially to utilize 
this new high resolution DEM that's been flown over Indiana to create watersheds on the mobile device, really to create a tool for, uh, well, for designing watersheds and grass waterways uh, out in the field. But I'll move on. We're really talking here today more about this larger project, OATA, which involves a whole lot of industrial partners, I think 18 so far. It stands for Open Ag Data Alliance. There's two aspects to it. One is the technical, and one is the less technical. The technical side of it really, where it's a volunteer built or an open source project to create sort of a cloud storage or REST API to allow various cloud systems to be controlled by a farmer and to also shop data amongst them. Less technically, we're creating guidelines to be OATA certified. These guidelines primarily consist of an example of the API that's written as an open source project. Companies can either use that example software or they can write their own as long as they are able to pass the technical tests that make it OATA certified. Okay, I wanna, there's been a lot of questions about OATA, so we really need to clarify some of these aspects of it. We're not selling commercial products. We're not a provider of cloud services. We're only providing uh, software that can be used to allow clouds to work together. We're not a political or lobbying organization. It would be a bad idea for me to be such a thing anyway. We don't intend to endorse or oppose products beyond providing the certification guidelines. The development, the other thing that's actually very important to mention here is that it's the development process and the software that are open, not the data. We are not saying that the farmer's data is open. Farmers worry about this a great deal. What we're trying to do instead is to provide the ability of farmers to control their data. If they later should choose to open it, that's their business, not mine. My brothers would have me skinned alive if I opened their data. Okay, uh, we've talked to, well, sometimes we kind of illustrate the whole idea here with a particular uh, example use case. The example use case we first developed was for planting. Today, though, in light of the topic, I thought it made sense to try to talk a little bit more about a prescription irrigation map, kind of from the point of view of the farmer. So there's two people here in this slide. One is Frank, a farmer, and the other is Andy, uh, an agronomist. Frank wants to use or Andy's services to create prescription irrigation maps. Now there is kind of a difference if you think about it between an irrigation prescription and a planting prescription. A planting prescription I likely will use one time at the beginning of the season. But I may run my center pivot around many times, dozen times or more uh, in the process of a season. In fact, it's really a dynamic thing. An irrigation map is probably dependent upon weather, uh, soil types, the needs of the crop at the time, and my risk or my estimation of risk, which actually is a very important part of how farmers decide when to water, They're very worried about getting behind. At any rate, if, if um, Frank wants to work with Andy and Andy's going to create this dynamic prescription map, he needs to give certain information to Andy, most likely yield data, soil tests, seed varieties, and other things that Andy would use to create this map. He may get that, some of the yield data from a particular OEM uh, from, the, from the combine through their cloud, maybe CNH or myjohndeere.com. He also is worried about the weather, of course. If, it was, if it's going to rain, perhaps I won't water as much. Uh, so weather data from NOAA. Uh, I also need to know about historical yield data. So he's likely keeping that on a computer, on a desktop, back in his office, probably running Windows 98. <laughs> Maybe the uh, fertilizer co-op has applied maps, uh, seed order receipts, perhaps even the prescription from planting from the, from the device in some other OEM's uh, cloud. Maybe this farmer also has some uh, Centec moisture sensors like shown in the lower right. Maybe he's using uh, crop metrics, that trace that's there is from my brother's farm from this, this summer and it's a crop metric sensor. He wants all of these things to come together to create this yield map, and then he'll give it to Andy, and Andy will put it on his computer and make a prescription map, which he'll give back to the farmer, and the farmer will somehow upload this, perhaps through AgSense, into his center pivot, and it will operate. Then what? 
Well, a lot of things could happen. Weather could change. I'm not going to like to imply that a valley pivot breaks down or anything, but you know, a pivot does break down once in a while. Or it gets stuck. This happens a fair bit for us. Back to square one we go. Okay, it becomes a real pain. You know, the way data would work today, and this is really the experience that farmers have, is that it's, it's a difficult situation. They're in the middle of it. That's the claim. And now if we have to redo this thing, we're in trouble. Why did we do it to start with? Well, we did it, of course, for success. We want to be more profitable, raise more corn, raise more soybeans, that sort of thing. So in coming up with this, Aaron came up, this is Aaron Alt here, but he came up with four minutes of decisions that he thinks he can't easily evaluate today just to make a huge list. Here's the huge list. Should we be doing cover crops? What type of tillage? What type of uh, fungicide? The irrigation map. Do I irrigate now? Is it risky? You know, if I don't irrigate enough, should I go around many times at a half inch each time or slower and do an inch? Seed spacing, down pressure, all of these questions are difficult to evaluate today, and farmers make them uh, every season, sometimes many times per season. We want to evaluate these decisions and make better ones for success. But it's not possible to do this very well today. We could do parts of it, and that's the promise, but we can't do it all. Why not? Well, farmers don't really own their data. If you look at the fine print in a particular OEM's uh, terms of service, you see that, in fact, they have the right to access, collect, and disclose the data at any time. And furthermore, the customer may not restrict the OEM's access to that and the use of that data. This causes some consternation to farmers. <coughs> now, it's kind of understandable. Um, you know, I, I'm at a university, and whenever we uh, get the lawyers involved to work out an agreement, you get lawyered up. So I, I don't want to overly blame this company. They have a, a very nice marketing, and they're very farmer-centric. But they have lawyers, and they have things to do with lawyers, and so that's what happens. Um, but it, it, does, it does cause problems. Uh, farmers really have been terms of service takers. What we're really kind of advocating for here in OATA is more openness to understand the terms of service, not necessarily try to dictate them. We don't want to dictate to industry at large or to farmers even what they should do. Farmers are grown-ups, that's our theory. Uh, the other reason we can't do things so well today is that nothing really works together all that well. There are too many trade-offs, machine versus data, too many machines. Most farms are a conglomeration of many machines over many generations. There's a high barrier to entry to innovators because of this. This is really how we got into it to start with. You know, as I began to work more and more on these things like ISO Blue, I wanted to do research, but there were too many non-disclosures to sign, too many agreements to sign to really do this easily. It was easier to try to figure it out on your own than to work in, within that system. Because of that, we have a central guiding principle here in OATA that we want to do open source, representing the software, and our guiding principle is that farmers own their data. That's going to give transferability. It's going to be easy to switch. If it's easy to switch, the market can pick the winners. Confident companies know they make good products and know they'll win their share of these battles. It's better to try to allow a little bit of freedom, a little bit of liberty to the farmer, and provide the best solution for that farmer. You'll win the business. Farmers, well, as I said, they're in control. That's a good idea. We've got to worry about security, so we are worrying about that. I'm not so much going to talk about that here. But essentially, interoperability, things begin to work together, and a lot of innovators can participate in this business. Now, OATA, what it provides is automated tests, third-party certification, and some clear language on openness about privacy. OK, back to the prescription irrigation map. How should it work? Well, farmer Frank ought to be on the side here. If the OATA thing comes to fruition, these clouds can communicate via the REST API that Frank provisions. Frank is able to provision to Andy the access to the data that Frank has on various clouds in order that Andy can do the job that's been requested and create the prescription. It's an open source project. The idea here is that volunteers and industry are freely writing code, public code, 
This is actually, it may sound astonishing, but uh, the internet is created this way. Uh, Apache Software Foundation, Linux, it goes on and on. It's very successful. In this fashion, standards grow out of implementation, not the other way around. Implementations become standards. Shapefiles are an example. Well, people don't like shapefiles, but by golly, they work. And market forces then ensure that there does not have to be only one way to do everything. If you recall back, well, maybe you won't remember, depending on your age, but long ago, there were many standards for images. In fact, there's still quite a few standards for images. JPEG, you know, PDF, EPS, PNGs. At one point, this was a real pain in the rear. It became much easier because software was written that allowed easy conversion between these standards. What we're arguing here is not that there's one ag data standard to rule them all, but that there be mechanisms to translate between them and that this be automated and hidden from the user. Uh, the project roadmap, currently we're at API spec very early, ver version 0.2. Uh, Climate Corporation, who's a partner in this, has, has uh, released a federated identity POC. There's 18 partners now on the web page. In the near term, I, that means this harvest, we're working on a commercial data exchange, and we're right in the middle of designing this, involving CNH, uh, Tierra Telematics, an Italian company, and uh, Geosys, a French company, to create real-time, uh, through the cloud, yield map uh, during harvest. Um, longer term, you can see the things we're working toward. It's moved very fast. It's an open source project that does help, tend to help that if people want to work. I want to thank you, and I'll be happy to answer questions here once I sit down. But I should probably, in full disclosure, indicate pivots, no matter what OATA does, may still occasionally get stuck. But that's OK, because there's a well-known open source solution to that problem. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, <Jim. laughs> Putting the farmer at the center is a, is a pretty interesting, believe it or not, it's, it's been sort of a challenge. Um, and, and speaking of putting far, farmers in the center, uh, my friend Mark Ryman works out in Gothenburg, Nebraska at the uh, at Monsanto's Water Utilization Research Center, and, and I guess you would call it your learning center out there. He's a learning center agronomist. And Mark's going to share with us how you take all this data and put it all together and, and formulate the when and the how much to water and, and really trying to identify, you know, what an optimal schedule would look like. And, and, and Mark has learned a lot of lessons. He's had some challenging times this year with weather. But Mark, I'll ask you to just jump up here and, and, uh, and share with the group what your experiences have been. Please welcome Mark. <clears throat> Uh, well, thanks, Andy. I'm glad to have the opportunity to be here and, you know, share what I do, uh, what I hope to do for farmers, and uh, the people on the panel here, you know, give me a lot of hope that some of the decisions things I'm going to visit about should get a lot easier for me, uh, because today there's still a lot of writing things down on paper, you know, utilizing Excel spreadsheets and formulating your own answers for the decisions that we have to make. Um, I did want to start off just a little bit with, you know, kind of what my story is. And we've had this theme of yield gaps today. And the examples in my family are pretty tremendous. And it's why I have a passion for what I do. Uh, I get the opportunity to work, you know, at a learning center that focuses on water challenges, specifically, you know, for water limited areas in the high plains, uh, like those at my family farms. So I grew up in north central Nebraska. It's a challenging environment to farm in. It's not one obvious obviously it's ideal. For some reason my family left Iowa in like the early 1900s. I'm not sure what they were thinking but I guess it's better pasture land maybe, I don't know. But you know our own farmland does not overlie the Ogallala Aquifer. So you saw that huge map of the, the Ogallala Aquifer and all the areas that, that overlie it. Well my part of Nebraska doesn't. Uh, so we don't have that ability to irrigate but we do rent some irrigated land in a county south of us. Uh, the Niobrara River Trench actually cuts off the water uh, to the north uh, that we would get from the Ogallala Aquifer. And drought's, drought's a constant threat for us. You know, it's what we farm, you know, with always that kind of looming in the background. I have something like six out of my seven uncles own farms. You know, my brothers are involved in farming. So it's one of those things that it's always in the background. 
And that yield gap piece they showed, in 2002, I remember my dad raising eight bushel corn as a farm average. And 25 times that on his rented irrigated ground. So there definitely is a lot of advances, or are a lot of advances to be made uh, in that space. You know, 2012 was a tough year, but he learned through no-till and things like that to improve the productivity of his dry land acre and tried to close that yield gap, but the irrigated yields just seemed to grow in that fashion. But, you know, those are the environments and you see a more normal situation in 2013. But that's what we farm in, and I, you know, I wouldn't trade, I'm trying to change my slide. I wouldn't trade, you know, the Niobrara River for anything. This is, you know, where my family ranches and things like that. But it is, you know, what does constrain us in terms of water. So what I want to highlight is nobody wants to waste water. We hear a lot of things about how agriculture wastes water. It's not, you know, it's not very efficient with it. There's got to be a better way. And I think there are better ways. But if we look at it from a standpoint right now, the farmers don't want to waste water. What they're left with is, they can't get left behind in their decision-making processes and not apply enough water, or they lose one of the factors that they're looking for, which is yield, to enhance their profitability. And they don't have a lot of integrated systems that help them make these decisions. Some of them use crop consultants. Some of the very savvy ones, I know some farmers that have moisture probes in every field, they wake up every morning, log into a website, check all their moisture probes, and make their irrigation decisions. But so far, those farmers are rare because of complications that they see and the, the time that it consumes in irrigation. And you have to analyze a lot of variables you know, to make accurate decisions around it. And it's something that I uh, face every day. And this is just a census of agriculture uh, paper that kind of highlights, or their data set that highlights that. And we look at what farmers do in terms of irrigation. Now, this data is from 2008, so it's dated. Unfortunately, the new data uh, for the 2013 survey comes out, I think, next Thursday, October 30th. So it'll be interesting to see how this updates. But if you look at that, and farmers could answer, they use more, um, more than just one of these services. You see that in the high plains, the, the dark green bar there, more than 80% of them go on what the crop looks like. You know, there's a lot of things that go into that. If you go out to the field, you see your crops leaf rolling you trigger an irrigation, or in the back of your mind, you're thinking it's been this long since it rained, it rained this much, I had this much in my soil profile. But there's not a lot of computation that goes on outside of a farmer's head in some cases. And then if we look at, you know, irrigating by the feel of the soil, that's the next most popular, uh, the next most popular piece of the puzzle. And that could be probing the soil, you know, down to 40 inches, doing your full hand feel method. Or it could be kind of kicking the surface and seeing what you think of it. So there's a lot of different methods, and the reason farmers tend to fall into these categories is they don't have a lot of easily used systems yet to help them make those decisions. Uh, interestingly, the next highest thing is what your personal calendar looks like in terms of irrigation. But you do see we are starting to make gains in soil moisture sensors, um, plant moisture sensors, and computer models in 2008 still made up less than 1% of what the farmers did. So that's pretty striking and obviously there's a lot of room for improvement and I hope that we see a lot of that in this uh, next report from the USDA. So where I work is the Learning Center. Uh, it's kind of a unique situation. Is it kind of an actual working farm near Gothenburg, Nebraska. We have a lot of tools that help us evaluate uh, irrigation strategies and how well they might work for farmers. So we have four linear overhead irrigation systems. So a linear is not a pivot. It walks in a straight line. And there's a reason pivots were invented first, because towing around the water hose is a pain. You don't want to use them if you don't have to. But they do help us get square blocks for our research work. And we've recently updated a couple of those systems with what we call VRI, or variable rate irrigation. So we can change the irrigation amount down the pivot by cycling off the nozzles at different time intervals rather than just controlling the speed of that, that linear as it moves across the field. We also have 120 drip irrigation zones. Most of those are subsurface drip irrigation to do work on, uh, but we do have some surface drip irrigation uh, zones in a special place. We have four groundwater wells at the site that provide water, so it is water out of the Ogallala Aquifer. We're in the Platte Valley in an area where you don't irrigate alfalfa because it reaches groundwater. The taproot actually 
makes it so you don't have to irrigate. But for corn and other crops, irrigation is required. We have a nice mix of dry land and irrigated acres, 170 dry land acres, um, that really provides us a tool to bring, we bring about 4,000 people through the Learning Center a year and visit with them about, you know, what's their dry land crop rotation, what are they doing uh, to save moisture in those systems, because we, we talk about water for food, we do talk a lot about irrigation, but a dry land person is, is a water manager. He just can't do anything to make up the difference if he doesn't get rainfall or if he makes a mistake in his cropping system. So the dry land acres are there. And then 150 irrigated acres where I have to do all the, the work you know, to make those irrigation decisions uh, out there in the field. And we try to display a lot of things so that farmers actually get a taste for what we do. So at the base, you know, soil maps provide a lot of our information. You know, they kind of give you that base framework of, okay, I've got a horde silt loam over here, I've got a cozed silt loam over there. How do I manage them differently? And then you can go through and get more detailed information, you know, whether that be through um, an EM map, you know, looking at variability among the soil types, see where the water holding capacity may be different based on your electrical conductivity of the soil. You know, you have lighter areas and areas that um, are going to, you know, require more irrigation water in the red potentially, or they're going to get droughtier faster, and then you have areas with greater water holding capacity in the blue. And then you can actually go to the level of, you know, pulling samples, you know, for the, for the different protocols that we do. Pull the sample, send it to the lab, you know, get your organic matter, get your soil texture, all those pieces that you need to integrate. And then that stuff pretty much resides, you know, from an analysis standpoint in an Excel spreadsheet that you get back from the soils lab. But you do have to integrate it into your decision making process. We do then, you know, focus on the crops that we're growing. I've got, you know, corn, soybeans would be the primary crops that we deal with because they are the ones most grown by farmers on irrigated situations in Nebraska. I think corn makes up about 70% of the irrigated acres in the state, but that fluctuates obviously in market conditions. And then we do have a focus on, you know, research in wheat. How can we impact that uh, for the high plains? And then we also do some work with sorghum. Uh, particularly popular with the visitors that we have from, from Kansas, Colorado, and Texas. Nebraska farmers, they don't like sorghum because it's itchy. That's what I've learned from them. So I think that's why my dad quit growing it as well. But, you know, it is an important crop that we utilize on the high plains, uh, especially in drought-stressed areas. So once you have that crop piece, you know, then you can load up what your, what your kind of growth curve is. You can put that into a model, follow the growth stage, then utilize a lot of the information we've had put out in scientific publications and, you know, kind of map the amount of water that it's going to need or you would project it needs based on its crop coefficient. Then you start to integrate the other pieces of data. And as I said, we try to show farmers a lot of different ways of collecting data or what they could do on their farm. And so you start out as simple as the ET gauge, you know, a very simple, relatively inexpensive tool that does a pretty accurate job of telling me how much water was evaporated last week, multiply that by a crop coefficient based on the corn's growth stage or the soybean's growth stage, and you can get a pretty accurate representation of how much water you need to put back. And then you can look at your rainfall, you know, through a weather station or just, you know, something at the field that the manual rain gauge, you see a lot of those out there. But you can integrate those pieces, and I've found that ET tracks pretty much the same for my weather station. Uh, to that ET gauge, but again, the data resides in separate sources. I have, you know, just kind of writing it down by hand what we get off of the, the ET gauge, and then you have a separate website to log into for your weather station. And then we get into monitoring soil moisture. We do use a variety of um, capacitance probes at the farm to give us a good look of actually what's in the soil profile, help us make decisions that way. Also look at the rooting depth of the crop. You know, you don't necessarily see the rooting depth, but you can certainly see where the plants are removing water. And we also use granular matrix sensors. And again, try to show farmers different systems they could potentially use. And then you have to integrate all that data to help make decisions in your different, um, different demonstrations or research projects that you have. And I also even go to the length in some cases of using the neutron probe. So that's pretty accurate, pretty out outdated, I would say, in terms of its usability, 
but it is one of those standards that still exists um, basically in scientific publications for water use in agriculture. And once you have that information, then you need to compare and say, okay, I'm going to make this decision. I believe my soil moisture is in the place I need to irrigate. Uh, I have, I've used this much water. I think we're ready to go. Then you go out, pull up weather forecasts, which it's great that weather data is getting more easily available and easy to utilize. And then you say, well, there's a 60% chance of rain tomorrow. Perhaps I won't trigger my irrigation. But in Nebraska, we never say rain is imminent. So that's one of those things that you, know, you don't necessarily depend on, but you can utilize it to kind of look out over the next few days and see, do I have to actually start irrigation? And you can make that decision with some really nice forecasting data now. So once I have that information, then I have to sit down and make a variable rate irrigation map. And this is manual on my PC. I integrate the different fields that I have, my decision to irrigate, and how much I want to irrigate those pieces of the field. And so all those little grids in there, that's a line that I can choose to irrigate separately with my system. Then I create a map, I put it on a thumb drive, and I uh, drive out to our linear. And I think you mentioned Windows 98. <laughs> the system on this linear, I believe, is DOS-based. So you can't have file names that are more than eight. It's hard for me to get into that. Like, why can it only be eight characters long? But I understand it's a DOS-based system. So once you have that loaded into the system, usually it goes well. Then you can hit that little start button there on the pivot panel. Now with a linear, you have to pull the hoses around for a few hours in the cords and get everything set. But once you push the start button, it kind of takes off from there and you can really start getting your data feedback. You know instantly if the well is turned on because that communicates remotely and we have a variable frequency well that depends, it, it cycles down so that it puts out the right amount of water no matter how many irrigation zones that you're running. Then you start looking at the feedback piece of it, and we do use some of the AgSense products there. You know, they provide me peace of mind knowing where my linear is in the field, how it's progressing, whether it's got pressure in it. This, this shows it stopped. That's why it's red, but it shows where it's sitting in my field of the Learning Center um, right now. And I haven't got any text messages that said it started up this morning, so I know that's where it's sitting. And I can, you know, for me, I can send stop commands. I can tell it to do things. If I'm watching, you know, real-time feedback, I, I know it's raining, so I look at my cell phone. My weather station says I got an inch of rain. I can trigger to shut down the, the irrigation system or it's going to get stuck. Uh, th those are some of the problems that, that we have with it. The other piece of feedback that you can watch closely would be your flow meters, making sure that your nozzle package and the rate that you believe you're supposed to apply to that field is actually getting applied. But again, those are pieces of data that you really need to put together. And there hasn't been an easy way, I guess, that we've seen at the Learning Center to do that yet. And I think we're starting to see definitely a lot of progress in that. Some of the other decision factors that, that we're working on at the Learning Center are, you know, based on, uh, you, we saw the crops that we work with, corn, soybeans, uh, wheat, and sorghum. And we're doing some work starting out in corn, particularly, and trying to understand using variable rate irrigation, you know, what's the response to that germplasm? When I said corn, well, corn is corn, but we know based on performance that corn is not uh, respond all the same based on what variety you plant out there in the field. So we're trying to do work where we provide the same sets with full irrigation, you know, 70% irrigation and 50% irrigation to understand if a farmer has that environment where he can't keep up with water, what's going to be that best recommendation for him? It may not be the hybrid that at full irrigation rises to the top in terms of yield, but it's going to be that hybrid that's stable under his limited irrigation environment. So we want to be able to bring that piece of the puzzle uh, to the table for farmers, and also doing more basic research like what density should you plant of that hybrid and things like that in those different environments to help him maximize his productivity. Because there's a lot of work being done to help understand that and bring our piece of, of what we can do with our corn genetics to the table. And then the other tool that we have that's pretty unique is our rainout shelter. It's a 60 by 180 or an 80 by 160 foot Balin building on rails. And the goal is because it, it does rain about 22 inches a year at Gothenburg on average, to be able to make, you know, irrigation, I'd say kind of make irrigation real to farmers and try to say, okay, 
We didn't get any rain on this plot. We know how much moisture was in the soil. I know how much my, I irrigated, and this was my yield in our environment, so that we can talk about a farmer in the Republican Basin who's limited to 10 inches of water or 12 inches of water. You know, what irrigation pattern did I use to maybe achieve 150 or 160 bushels per acre under those constraints? Those are things we can utilize the rainout shelter to talk about. And then also put in there, you know, what if you're a farmer that has a limited well? There are farmers that are limited on allocation in our region. There are farmers that are limited um, by what their well can produce. You know, the, the well pressure drops throughout the season. They start getting less gallons per minute per acre. And so simulating, if we can apply an inch of water every seven days or 15 days or 20 days, what type of yield response could they respond? expect from hybrids. So those are the pieces of the puzzle you know, that we're trying to bring to the table. And I'm glad to see the amount of work that's being done on helping me make irrigation decisions there at the Learning Center. Thanks. Thanks, Mark, very much. Yep. So once we've gotten to that point where we've tried to figure out the irrigation puzzle, Somehow or another, we have to identify the fact that irrigation is one spoke in this comprehensive wheel. And Lance Donnie is involved in, in the software business from the farm management information side. And, and I'd ask you to welcome Lance so he can tell us a little bit about what his experience has been here. Well, thank you. And I appreciate the opportunity to talk uh, with you today. <clears throat> well, we've heard everything from the hardware in the field to the problems with data ownership and control and how data moves around to how, which is a great, I want that deck if you don't mind. It's a great illustration of the hassle that a grower has to go through to make an irrigation decision. And if you then multiply that by 100 pivots, how does a grower make a decision about what they need to do today if we ask them to do that every single day? And do we think maybe there's an opportunity to improve how we help that grower make that decision. So On Farm is in the business of providing software and analytics to help that grower make that decision. I'm the founder and CEO. We're out from California, so actually this was close to us. And I grew up in ag. We had table grapes and raisins. I'm sorry, I didn't grow corn or <laughs> beans or other things. I grew the, not the $300 wine, it was the cheap stuff. So, um, but I spent 20 years in software. And so when we started On Farm in 2012, we started with the objective of solving the data connectivity problem. How do you make data and information meaningful, accessible, easy to use for the grower? And can we use the lessons we've got in IT to help improve that process? So we built what was called, what we call today an Internet of Things platform. So that's connecting devices and data in the cloud in a common platform. It's really common in other areas outside of, of ag. Um, and so from that time, we've integrated 30 companies. So we work with some of the best companies in the ag space where we connect to their devices and data and bring that all in one platform. We've won a number of awards, including IBM's North American Entrepreneur of the Year, Top 50 Global Startup, as well as the best M2M technology in agriculture. So we think we're onto something important and how we help that grower make that decision. And if I can work my technology, there we go. So what is the Internet of Everything, or Internet of Things, big data and analytics? So the Internet of Everything is connecting, it's more than just connecting the devices. So we have some common examples of the Internet of Everything I'm sure you're familiar with. You've probably heard of Nest, which are connected meters for your house, for your, for your home air conditioning units and carbon monoxide and other things. You've got smart meters from utilities and water meter companies and so forth. And you have smart appliances. Your refrigerator telling your iPhone you need eggs, right? So, but in agriculture, we have the same opportunity. As Terry mentioned, we've got devices in the field, sensor data, equipment, and so forth that collect information locally and then move that data up into the cloud. The problem with the internet of everything, and, and we see that globally with these, pro with, with these types of solutions, is the number of data points coming in from these diverse sets of, of, of devices is overwhelming. There actually has to be new paradigms and new platforms developed 
in order to consume that data in the way that it comes in and make it make sense for the user. So why Nest is so, was, was so important and valuable is it simplified the process of you setting your thermostat. Now, everybody understands how to set a thermostat, but they built a multi-billion dollar company because they were, went about it in a smart way. So when you were home, your temperature, it knew you were home, and your temperature changed based on your being there. When you left, it was smart enough to know that, hey, we don't need to have the house at 72 degrees anymore. Let's raise the temperature, save some energy, and let's do that automatically. So those are the same concepts the Internet of Everything and analytics can bring to agriculture. So what is big data? So we've talked about big data, and many of you may know, very well may know what big data is, but let's set that bar. Big data is three core concepts, volume. And in agriculture, we're talking about billions and quite soon trillions of readings, files, images, forecasts, recommendations, data points that are coming out of the field or the cloud or satellite image and so forth. So lots and lots of data. We've got variety. So in the different companies that produce data and sensors and new technology, we have this very diverse uh, set of information. We have to figure out how that all works together. And then we have velocity. So these devices produce e data every day, all day, 24-7, 365. And that becomes disruptive, right? So we get all these data, these little devices and data and systems in the field pushing out information about what's going on. And you have to figure out how to be able to consume that in a way that doesn't become overwhelming for anybody. And by the way, there's no interoperability, right? Every, everybody's device, sensor, equipment, system talks a different language. It's a t I used to call it the Tower of Babel. It's really complex, and then you, when you add the geo-referencing on top of that, it becomes an extremely interesting and tough challenge. So, and then the last component of this, what is analytics? Everybody understands analytics is the ability to analyze the information and turning the data into knowledge. It doesn't matter that we have big data sets unless we can help the grower, the grower create action and outcome. They'll never use a system unless it gives them those elements. And to do that, we actually have to think differently about technology. We have to develop new generation of technologies and systems and skill sets that aren't in great numbers in agriculture. And the last component, I think oftentimes it's overlooked when, you, when, when people talk about big data solutions, is the grower needs to accept it. We can't simply push down an idea or a concept or a recommendation that they won't go that they, that, uh, about a practice that we expect them to go out and change something in the field unless they can go out there and see that that recommendation or that process actually helps them grow better. If we don't do that, we will fail in the analytics and systems we develop. So what's the data look like? So this is our own numbers. Welcome to challenge them. No one studies them that we can find out, but I think it's interesting. So as we've seen some 2,000 global population, about 6 million, about 100,000 plus or minus connected devices in, 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 in agriculture. That may be conservative. And about two data points per farmer globally per day. Not a lot of data to make decisions on coming out of the field. The estimates by 2020 is we'll have about 2 billion connected devices globally, which when you look at, the globe, at every global farmer, they'll have almost 200,000 data points coming at them every single day. Satellite data, weather data, soil data, crop data, crop system information, recommendations, you name it. It's about 100 trillion data points globally per day. By 2035, they'll have about 4 million data points per day. It's about 2,000 trillion data points globally per day. So if we don't have systems to figure out how to deal with this data, how are we expecting them to use that information? So we're here to solve that problem. So we build special API or connectors to all these systems. The companies I mentioned earlier um, that we build every hell of different systems. We build a data connector to their API, either the device in the field or the cloud, 
We automate that process. We build it once. We scale it across n number of customers. We bring that into our platform. Then we can run analytics, provide communication, alert systems on top of that, and we simplify and make transparent how that grower gets access to that data. And then we give them a dashboard that allows them to make decisions about what they need to do easily every single day. We don't force them into how that works. We enable that process of recommendation analytics, both with the trusted base relationship in the field and the farmer and their, in their knowledge locally about what's going on. We give them the information to make that decision and execute to grow better crops. So how does that work in practice? So we're in partnership in the Flint River area of Georgia. Um, the river there is impacted for water use. They've got a million acres of cropland, mostly sweet corn and peanuts. Um, they have a real water problem. So we're working with IBM, the University of Georgia, and the USDA to develop systems in order to close loop that process. So in, in, in short, can we take soil data, crop data, weather data, and can we drive an irrigation decision real time delivered right to the equipment that makes a uh, the right decision about how much to water real time. So when the weather changes in three hours, which it often does, can we be smart enough to change that decision quickly and deliver it to the equipment? So it's not a binary decision. The grower doesn't say, I'm going to water or not water today based on what I think the weather's going to look like, but how much should I water given that change? And can we use analytics to do that? So what does that smarter irrigation system mean when we connect those devices and data together? It closes the loop. We think we can do that in Georgia. We think that we can do that in lots of areas. And so what's, this, what's the potential? The University of Georgia thinks that analytics and these closed loop systems can save 15% water in the area. That's 50 billion gallons in Georgia alone, enough for the top 10 cities in the state for the entire year. As I mentioned, I'm from California, where we, obviously everyone knows we're in a severe drought. This year, 52% of the water available in California will be used for agriculture, 52%. If we can save 15% in California, that's 4 million acre feet a year. So if we want to improve the economic return, if we can create sustainability for the grower in the US and globally, we have to implement these systems. So how do we take this, how do we take what we're doing in the US and go global? Well, it's very much like the phone. So we've, I think every, we've, we've heard through this whole last two days, cell phones and, and global farmers are using cell phones and so forth. I'm gonna reiterate that point. Global farmers or cell phones are being used in third world countries, not because they had copper wire that they put in the ground and they did decide AT&T went out there and put copper wire everything and put a rotary phone out there and then went to the cell phone. They went to the cell phone because they leapfrog technology. I think global farming is going to do the same thing, right? So we've spent 50 years developing systems in order to help farmers irrigate better and, and plant better and do all those things. They will leapfrog those, frog those things by taking what's successful in the U.S. and scaling it and developing ways to use it in their markets. We'll do, we've done a lot of the research here. The best and brightest are working in the U.S. on those things they will be able to pick from those solutions that fit those markets and, and, and deploy those successfully in their areas. So it's up to us to drive the innovation in order for that global farmer to be successful. So I think I'm out of time. I thank you for the opportunity uh, to talk to you. And I think we're going to go to a general session now, or a, 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 a you got it. conversation. Thanks, Lance, very much. And, and thanks to all the panelists for their, for their brief presentation on their area of expertise. And I, I would invite um, uh, anyone who has questions. Are there questions out here? And if there are, there are a couple of microphones set up. I believe they're live, yes? Um, we'd like to uh, uh, perhaps get a session started. One of the things I wanted to correct Lance on, um, he used the analogy of nest, and I'm from Michigan and still live there. And while he was talking, I actually took a quick look on my tablet at what the temperature is back home. It's 46 degrees. So if we raise the temperature to 72 today, Lance, we're really not saving energy today. We're more or less. Fair enough. I'm from, it was 84 in Fresno today. Certainly, certainly. 
Um, questions from the audience? Um, certainly this, this group has, um, has a great deal of experience in, in dealing with this, this interconnectivity, interoperability problem. And, and sir, I'll let you jump in. Please identify yourself, and if you have a specific um, panelist that you'd like to direct your question to, please let us know. Francisco Muñoz Arriola, University of Nebraska Lincoln. The question is for Lance, and I'm sorry with the old panelists, I missed the first two. <clears throat> and probably you talk about this, and it's about the interoperability. So you mentioned the key aspect of interoperability in the terms of uh, gathering the information and communicating this information or sending information across different platforms. What is the level of uh, advancement in interoperability in the system that you develop? I what is the room to improve, uh, not just in your system, but as well in the, in the proposal to globalize this activity? Well, so, so today we're collecting data from a um, very broad spectrum of, of data types. And, and what we found is that most, because there hasn't been a standard and OATA is working on, I think, the right way to approach, uh, a very good way to approach that. Um, creating that, common out, that commonness between the data. We see JSON, XML, flat files, manual data. We see a really broad spectrum of data types. And, and we're, we're, we, that doesn't bother us. We, we, we know that that's how the industry's developed and, and, and how we have to support it today. But the, the, I think the opportunity we see is that when you bring that data together, it creates a really rich and interesting picture. And if we understand how that to normalize that and bring it together. Then when you talk about a third world country or, or, or a product in which we're developing an analytic product that delivers a recommendation, maybe via voice or cell phone or something, we have all this rich data to model, right? So if we talk to modelers and, and, and data scientists, they are data junkies, right? They want as much information as possible. We're pulling in that institute data from the field that they can leverage then across big data systems like weather and so, and, 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 and satellite data and other things that gives you that, that field, the, the vision from the field. So we hope that companies improve how they're, or they're providing access to information. It's really messy now. I think we're the only company that's, we're one of the companies that have made the most progress in connecting those things. And, but I think that's going to take several years um, uh, to, to solve. At least we hope, uh, uh, we hope it gets solved at some point. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Hi, Graham Jeffries from Tufts University. Uh, it's a tremendous boon to everyone to finally have data unlocked and uh, bringing it into management decisions. Uh, a lot of this data, of course, is coming from distributed sensor networks, whether they're in situ or um, satellite derived. One of the you know, key challenges here, especially as these sensors are developed in laboratories and then deployed in fields, is uh, an issue of maintaining uh, calibration in the field. and uh, managing the uh, corresponding error that's introduced in uh, networks, uh, often unman in an unmanaged way. Uh, can you speak to how you would imagine managing error propagation uh, through your recommendations, uh, especially addressing this issue of uncertainty in the management recommendations that we're making derived from some of these systems? Thanks. Who's that to? Don't everybody jump at once. <laughs> That, that, is a, that is a very tough question, and I know, um, you know, one of the things, one of the ground truthing mechanisms that, that Mark uses, for example, is, you know, he'll finally pull the neutron probe out of the closet. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, funny, funny story about that. I, I, the first time I toured out there, they said it was easier for them to gain access to a neutron probe than it was to even think about putting up a basketball hoop out there um, because of the liability associated with that. Anyway. So uh, there's a couple of ways to handle that, right? One is, is density of, of, of data, right? So if you, have one, if you have density, and that means that the cost of those data points have to come down. But if you have density in data, if you have one that goes out of calibration, it can be removed from the, from the data set. Um, otherwise, you have to make sure that every data point is, is, is correct. And it's, you're probably doing some in-field work to do that. Yeah, you just have to, from our standpoint, it's focusing on watching our sensors and making sure that you know, the feedback you get seems to make sense. You can occasionally, with the moisture probes, if the soil 
shrinks a little bit or something like that, you'll pull away and lose your moisture readings. But those are the more easy ones to detect. I'm not sure about all of the possible calibration errors that you might see. But it certainly is a concern that we have to watch out for. And I think it, it leads back to a little bit of what we saw you know, in that, that 2008 eight data set that I showed of farmers not necessarily trusting the data. Sometimes they've gone out, they've tried sensors, they've gotten really excited, they, they were going to use the technology to, to help them irrigate, and for some reason the, the sensor kind of, kind of misfired or you know, the installation didn't go very well, didn't happen on time, and maybe the calibration wasn't correct or it wasn't placed in the same location because density is an issue when you're talking about the cost of sensors. and you know, I think we're going to be working past that in some cases for a while, but some farmers have learned to have a lot of success, and I, you know, we'll kind of just watch the sensors themselves and make sure they're making sense. We tell farmers all the time, if you don't, tr the, the sensor's probably not broken, right, unless it, something happened to it, and we can usually tell that. Rodents. It, I yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you can tell that, right, you're not, I'm not getting data, <laughs> but, um, but we tell them all the time, if you don't trust the, the sensor, go out and dig a hole, go out and check where that sensor is and, 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 and figure out what's going on. Um, because we have to get them to a point where they can trust that information. To, and I know that doesn't answer your question because you're looking at it from a data problem, but from a grower's problem, they got to be able to trust that sensor. And it, otherwise, we failed in how we deliver technology. I think this also drives home the point of how intensely local precision ag is. Okay, if you don't have that local support, uh, that can tell and give you the confidence that these sensors are working properly, it's going to create distrust in, in, the, in the data. So I think to drive that point home again, you have to have that local support from those trusted advisors and boots on the ground. There are no magic bullets in this game. And uh, I think sometimes we overshoot the runway and we oversimplify things. Uh, so I think the point is, uh, you got to have that support to assure that the, these devices are working properly. I'd like to make one additional point. Um, it's not merely a matter of calibration. Even properly calibrated sensors observe, make their observations in noise. So it's something that people in signal processing communications have studied. I mean, the way your wireless device is designed is to determine the information that was sent to it in the observation in the presence of noise. All of these sensors have noise characterizations. What we have to do is we, we need to understand the accuracy. And then the big data problem is obviously a problem of a statistical estimation or statistical decision making. So it's very important to realize that yield is not something you perfectly measure in a production system. So it is a matter of calibration, but even once they're calibrated, they're not perfect. So big data and analytics and decision making have to account for that. Yes, sir. Marcos Folegati from University of São Paulo, Brazil. Uh, yes, please, could you uh, mention about the costs of this, all this technique that's been used for, for the farmers and how do you convince the farmers to use it considering all the increase of production that we can get? Cost of implementation, correct? Is that cost of implementation? Is that? Well, the cost of the whole system, right? Sure, I, sure. You, and, and Terry, I guess if you could lead with that. Well, well, I guess I didn't understand the nature I, of the question. So, so getting the, start with getting the machine connected. What is the actual cost in getting the, getting a machine connected or getting a sensor connected? Okay, that's a great question. Okay, there's a, there's a great deal of variation into cost. Uh, of getting the machine connected. And I'll just give you uh, our example at AgSense. Uh, for us to get connected to an irrigation uh, pivot, it's roughly $1,000 US, $1,000 to $1,500 US, okay? And there's other uh, companies out there that are more or less uh, than that. Then we talk about the sensors. Uh, we talk about flow meters or, or soil moisture sensors. Uh, you have the cost of the sensor and some of the capacitance probes. Uh, <clears throat> in which the price of those probes are coming, have come down substantially in the last uh, 12 to 24 months. Uh, you're looking somewhere around $1,000 for the probe, but also the telemetry devices. Uh, there are folks out there uh, that have telemetry 
that's somewhere in the, the realm of 250 bucks on up to 2,500 or $3,000. So there really is a lot of variation in the cost of implementing uh, the different technologies. Uh, I think those costs, you know, each grower, each region has to uh, do their research and find out what really fits for them. And it really comes down to a return on investment. If the return on investment is there and it's tangible, it, it, it's pretty easy to see the benefit. Uh, if not, uh, it, it's not gonna be ad adopted. And Lance, I mean, when, when connecting the dots. Right, so we're a software only solution. So uh, for, for us, a grower subscribes on an annual basis per seat for their organization. So a typical grower might have you know, uh, an average size grower might have two, three, four seats. It might cost them $3,000 a year total for the software side. It doesn't matter how much data, how many data points, sensors, integrations, and so forth. And how this transfers, again, one of the things that Terry mentioned is the costs keep coming down. Part of this is we're, we're further into this process now. There's more competition in this area. Um, we have some open source initiatives um, being developed right now. So the the idea here is that, it, how much did we pay for our first pocket calculator? And I know my dad paid about $160 for his first US, for his first pocket calculator, and now we just give these things away. So this all starts somewhere, and we're, we're, we're not necessarily on the, on, the, on the front end of this, but we're, we're certainly, um, we're into this a little ways, but we're a long way from finished. The evolution, this isn't necessarily an evolution, it's a revolution still at this point. One other thing I'd like to add to, to this, Andy, there's also an intangible piece to deploying this technology. It's not necessarily about monitoring, controlling these machines or reading the sensors. Technology is also gonna simplify uh, the transfer of knowledge to those, say, take for instance a smaller grower, okay? That data can get uh, transferred to a trusted advisor, and then from there, the knowledge can spread out to those small uh, stakeholders. Uh, so what it does is it speeds up the transfer and simplifies uh, the knowledge, and it removes all walls, okay? The internet, in general, removes walls and allows information to flow more freely. Yes, sir. I am Gordon, I'm a technology consultant. Um, this is kind of for the whole panel. A lot of large companies view their data as proprietary, and it's one of their you know, big assets. How willing have the largest players in the industry been to open it up? And if we came back in three years and we're sitting here again, what do you think it'll look like then? I'm gonna put that one on Lance for starters. Right. Um, so when we started, that was one of the big, in 2012, that was one of the big questions is, would any of the big companies work with you, right? Because it's, you know, proprietary data. And what we found is that, it, um, that data connectivity is, is kind of like uh, capitalism, right? Once it gets started in, the, in, in ag, it's, it's, it's an immovable force. And that companies now, I mean, we've got 32 companies, and, and Valmont is, is, a, is a, good one, a good partner of ours and a great example for the industry. Um, and, and Deere and others are saying, you know, it's the grower's data. You know, we're, in our opinion, we're stewards of that data. And that trend is not gonna be stopped. That, there's no company, and, and we're a small company, so it's easy for me to say this, but there's no company in the ag space that is gonna be able to have a monopoly on that data set. That, that, that horse has left the barn. Can I ask Terry in, in certain yeah, experience? In certain regards, um, it, it's not so much who owns the data, it's who controls the data, okay? Uh, where is the data? A lot of us really don't know where the data is. Uh, as far as, I, I, as a common theme, I think people in general agree that the data belongs to the grower. But I think what you'll see is in this ecosystem between growers, uh, uh, industry folks, uh, there will be a, the data will get shared, but what will happen is they'll understand the playing field. 
and what is going to be done with my data, what's not going to be done with the data. Uh, I, I hear some growers say, well, I want to get paid for my data. Well, I don't know exactly how that will play out in the future, and I think some of that will be get played out in the future. I don't know as though it's going to be people writing a farmer for a check, uh, but data could become potentially a profit center for growers uh, down the road. But uh, I do think we'll continue to have this discussion within the industry. Uh, it's been a, a healthy discussion, and uh, it'll continue to evolve. But in, I'm not sure if growers are going to, yeah, I don't know if growers ever get paid for their data. That'll, the data, that'll be an interesting mm -hmm. calculation. You know, I, I think what could potentially happen is like see people writing a check, but there are consumers of data, and what they may do is assist people uh, as far as in rebating, but take uh, uh, energy companies, uh, for instance, they could get a, a potentially a reduced rate uh, on on their energy uh, consumption, uh, or perhaps crop insurance. Uh, yep. You know, well, having that data, they're going to get value out of out of their data, an inherent added value to their organization that could that improves profitability. I think it's also important that. Um, there be openness about the data and that farmers can make their decisions based upon that. There are companies out there whose profit model or business model involves selling data that they buy or they get from farmers. I don't, I'm kind of suspicious that that's not going to work out myself because I think the individual bit isn't worth enough and the farmer has perhaps a, uh, an expanded view of how valuable this particular data is. Uh, but I think the main thing is that it be played out in the marketplace. And uh, when that's done, then I think things work out reasonably well. And uh, these open ideas, that's basically it. It's one of the reasons we don't want to say, we say that the farmer controls his data, but then you might, you begin to ask a lot of other questions. Uh, it depends upon the agreement the farmer makes with the combine company. Mm -hmm. uh, but that agreement is open, the farmer's a grown up, the farmer makes the deal. Then the farmer works with the agronomist and the agronomist makes a precision planting map. Does the agronomist own it or does the farmer own it? It doesn't matter as long as everyone knows and it's up front as to who owns it. So I think that's the way it has to play out in the marketplace. Uh, with transparency, and then I think it will work okay. Well, in, in just as a footnote to that, there's a, there's a distinction between raw data, between information, and then a recommendation. And at which point in the value chain are you intercepting that data, and then what intellectual property is associated with that? Mm -hmm. And again, these are areas that are, by and large, we still, in agriculture, are living in the Wild West. Right, it has to be figured out. It's. Um someone pays for a service, part of the terms of service are I own the result. I can now resell it, it's mine, they don't have it, or part of the terms of service are that you're just renting it. Yeah. You know, that just has to be worked out. Well, and, and since no one's at the, at the mic here, there's a couple of things, really when you get down to, uh, of the panelists up here, no, I mean, Jim, you're a user, but Mark has to live and breathe this stuff. And, and Mark, well, I don't want to put you on the, uh, I don't want to put you really too much on the spot, but I mean, what do you see in your role there? I mean, you're working with farmers every day. You have a lot of folks come through there, uh, through the facility there in Gothenburg. What do you think um, the three biggest changes in, in irrigation management are that you will see over the next, you know, three years, five years, seven years, perhaps? What, what do you What do you think is going to happen out there? Well, I, I think we're going to see, you know. It, it start to change more rapidly in using, uh, using tools and data to reinforce their irrigation decisions where maybe they haven't been able to in the past. Because the other big piece that I think is coming down, and if you, if you survey growers or, or ask them what their thoughts are, uh, they see more regulation going to occur in their areas, whether that be you know, regulation in terms of how much water they can apply or you know, they are going to have meters on their wells so that the irrigation in Nebraska's case, the Natural Resource District can actually, you know, see how much they're applying in a watershed, you know, or just the fact that they're over a portion of the aquifer that's maybe you know, 
being depleted or their wells aren't going to yield as much. So you're going to have that. They're going to be more limited in the irrigation options that they have. And I think that's going to hopefully you know, push them towards using more data to make their decisions. And then there should be uh, people available to help them make those decisions, whether that be through the technology or integrating uh, more of the sources of the data from feedback sensors and things like that. But you know, I think that's going to be the big shift. More regulation will drive the need to conserve water more. Because right now, farmers don't want to waste water, but it, it's a little easier to, to, I guess in your word, shoot high in terms of the water amount you put on. And as we get more regulated, that's not going to be an option. That's not what people want to do. But I think they'll get more reliable data, start to trust, start to trust the data, and use it in the face of regulations. Swat. So Arthur Mark from University of Nebraska Lincoln, uh, Andy. I would like to see some uh, some discussion about the. So far, the discussion has been between the farmer and the private industry, which is great. But I think we should not bypass the strong and, and huge influence and, and, and impact of the universities in that in that process. Uh, so I would like to, you know, ask the panel to address some of the ideas they have about the university grower and the private industry partnership. Uh, one of the, my colleague's, colleague's question on, on soil moisture calibration, I think has some implication to this partnership because we do that on a daily basis at the university in our research programs. In fact, some of the accents, uh, theory, you know, some of the you know, uh, moisture sensitive reduce curves you use, we calibrated those for eight major soil types in the state. Uh, in Nebraska, and it's being used in extensively in your program. Uh, the crop coefficients that I measured are being used in Gothenburg Learning Center uh, in Nebraska with ET gauges. So there is an embedded partnership in this process, but I think we need to, we need to um, perhaps do more detailed partnerships and, and more of that. So I just wanted to, I was curious to see the, the role of that um, partnership bringing the, the governmental institutions' partnerships, too. So growers, private companies, universities, and, and government institutions. Because it's, the challenge is huge, so one entity cannot solve that. So just wanted to have, see the, the view of the panel about this partnership. Well, and, and I'll give you a real quick answer. You know, some of the data products that we're working with right now, we've had interest directly from universities in, in, in how they might take, you know, for example, out here, Troy Peters has this ag weather net. Um, how you can work from that ag weather net and, and push that information directly into a system of execution and perhaps get a work record back and then add that as applied information right back into his equation so that we can get an accurate estimate because one, one of the biggest difficulties, one of the biggest challenges we had on the machinery side and on, on, the, on the actual delivery side was how do you measure, and, and Terry's had to go through this too, how do you actually measure or, or be able to report how much as applied water went down? And then, of course, we deal with all the challenges of infiltration and other circumstances that made, uh, I guess, uh, shrink the efficacy of, of that application. And so um, I think by moving, particularly, and I'll ask Jim to jump in here too, particularly by moving into this open source environment, we're, we're giving an opportunity for the mines to gather. And, and to move in this open source direction so that at least if we have some willing partners, we can get the data transferred and we have the mechanisms in place. And Jim, would you jump in here on that sure. a little bit? Um, when we first started, of course, the OAD is only about since March. One of the first things that came up when we started to talk about it was there was a lot of confusion about uh, whether we were a cloud provider. And as a university, one of the big worries uh, for storing farmer data is that it's, uh, it's subject to freedom of information requests. So this, this really kind of left us to wonder is what the proper role was. There's a number of universities been out there wanting to make large data co-ops where people can come and join and uh, aggregate their data to make decisions. Um, but that particular aspect that it's foiable causes trouble. And so for that reason, we really kind of envisioned Purdue not being a provider of cloud services to farmers, unless the farmers so chose. There are farmers that want to work with the university so badly they don't really mind that their data might be uh, re released in this way. 
But when you look at the land-grant universities in the United States, there's a great deal of, uh, of many acres, thousands or millions of acres that are, uh, that are uh, under experimentation, and that data that's produced from them is largely not available publicly right now. There's no reason that that couldn't be open data, in fact. I think uh, these universities should create their own clouds. There ought to be a, a Boilermaker cloud. There ought to be a Husker cloud that uh, makes that data from, uh, from their research plots available subject to the funding constraints that created the data. If it were in an OATA type framework, the individual PI on the research would have the ability to control the access to that data just like a farmer would a farmer's data. I think this could be a very useful thing. We've fielded many requests actually from little startups that want access to Purdue research data and they find after the fact that maybe the PI is not against it, but, the, but quite frankly it's just not practical because the data is stored on a, in a dusty uh, cabinet somewhere because the graduate student graduated two or three years ago and no one really knows where it is or it's on a zip drive that's been lost or just a PDF that was printed out and put in a file. So I think a lot can be done there. I think that's a very important aspect of it. We hope to do something along those lines. Well, and, and certainly the enabled systems haven't been there <clears throat> for that long. Yeah. You know, in, in, in regards to Dr. Mock's uh, comment, uh, I believe, and, and I may not have the numbers correct, I believe you have well over 1,000 cooperators that are are collecting soil moisture data, and they were primarily and are primarily gathering that data uh, physically uh, from those sites. And so what we saw as an opportunity, they've done all this research, and these growers understand, they've built nice tools for these growers to really understand uh, what their soil holding capacity is, what the water tension is, and it's pretty easy to understand. So what we saw as an opportunity uh, was to work uh, with Dr. Ermach and the work they've done and is just simply put a graphical user interface uh, to that by tying into those uh, sensors, getting the data to our cloud and putting that, that same material that they've been looking at on a piece of paper just in front of them on, in their, their PC or their iPhone or, or Droid device and make it available and store that to them. So what we did is there's, a, as I referred to earlier, is a simplification of data use and utilizing resources that are being currently used uh, to lower that, the cost of ownership and ease of implementation. Well, and just one last point to that is that also private industry is still trying to figure out what makes, it, um, what makes a profit, what, what generates a return on investment, what's going to be viable in the marketplace. And oftentimes we have the ability to move faster in a private situation than we do in a, in, in a, in a research environment. And uh, that's not an editorial, that's not, it's just, it's just the way things move. We, 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 it, depending on who the entities are, particularly with the entry of a lot of startups, in the software environment and in the device environment, you know, things are moving relatively quick. And we've had to, one of the things we've struggled with on the machinery side, we, we build assets that last 25 or 30 years. Now we're dealing with 12 month development cycles and a life cycle of a product of about two years. Th this is a huge cultural intervention that has to take place within our companies. Yes, sir. Thanks, um, John Gates, uh, Climate Corporation. Um, I'd be curious to get the take of the panel on um, the idea of uh, best use and storage of uh, metadata. Um, I'm a little surprised that it hasn't come up so far. In my own research, I find that, you know, in, in the big data context, uh, a lot of information is lost when we divorce the numbers from the context. And I'd just be curious about your, your experience and thoughts on that. I'm going to push Lance a little bit on that one. Sorry, you're the you're the software guy here. No, that's that's an overstatement. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, so to run the risk of of completely embarrassing myself on my technical capabilities, I'll cover metadata. Um, so it's extremely important just you, uh, knowing where that data came from, right? So I would boil it down to that. So knowing the the, the data point itself is is got value at, at one level, but knowing Thus, what we call in like Ag Gateway, that set up, pro, you know, what that data, the condition that data was in when it took its reading. So it's interesting to know that the soil moisture was at 34%. Okay. 
um, compared to what? And, but it's really important if I know, like if I want to measure my crop over time, is what the condition of that crop was when those conditions took place. So we look at the layer of data as extremely important. So not just the, the soil, the plant, the equipment, the weather, and the imaging data. How do you, that, you know, that metadata, how do you determine, you know, that, that whole scope of information in its context? is meaningful then for making decisions. We didn't discuss it here, that's pretty technical, um, but I, I don't think you can make good recommendations if you don't have good metadata. Well, and unfortunately, we are out of time, and again, I promise try to not stand in between you all and lunch, and certainly the panelists will be here for the next, you know, this afternoon at least. I know a couple have to take off, but um, please feel free to, to visit with the panelists uh, offline at lunch. Um, I found these guys to be very open, and please, um, let's show our appreciation for their time today. Thank you. And any, any announcements related to lunch? I think we're next door here again today, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know if we have water for food staff here. Yeah. I believe we're right around the corner here again.